Even before the ink was dry on the designs for the M3 Medium, in August of 1940, Ordens told the designers to get started on the replacement vehicle, but this happened in February of 41 simply because they were too busy putting the finishing touches onto the M3. The resulting product was manufactured in September of 41. It was the Medium Tank T6. The remit the designers were given was pretty simple. Put the 75mm into a rotating turret and make the tank smaller than the M3. The T6 showed up at Aberdeen for testing. It was a strange combination of the archaic and the modern. Certainly the stabilized gun and the synchro mesh transmission showed promise. On the other hand, you still had something that had fixed forward firing machine guns and it had all of four hatches for the five crewmen. Two of those hatches were in the whole sides. The first of the production M4 A1s was built in the Lima Locomotive Works in February 1942. This was sent to Aberdeen Proving Grounds to work out some of the bugs. They were built to a British contract. The second tank was sent to the United Kingdom for testing. It was named Michael, uh, possibly after Michael Duar, the head of the British tank mission in the US. That tank can still be seen today at the Tank Museum in Bobbington, still in a shiny gloss green with the fixed forward firing machine guns. As such, it is the oldest surviving Sherman tank. We're going to move forward a little bit to August of 43 though. And the reason we're going to do this is that's when the Montreal Locomotive Works ceased production of the Ram and started production of the Grizzly. Now the Grizzly is basically an M4A1 built with a couple of local tweaks in Canada. Most of the 188 Grizzlies that were manufactured did not see combat. As a result, they generally survived the war. Thus, most of the M4A1s you see in private hands or in museum today are actually Grizzlies, which have been backdated to look like an American M4. This vehicle behind me here at the Military Vehicle Technology Foundation, Patola Valley, California, is indeed one of these Grizzlies and will be the subject of our tour, which will of course happen in the usual manner, outside first, engine, and then in part two we go inside. Pleasantries out of the way, let's get going. Now we're going to start off with the first elephant. This particular M4 has been parked in between its two close contemporaries. The T3476 on one side, the Panzer IV on the other. And immediately you'll see that this tank is not the smallest of the three. Most of this extra height is in the hull. The turrets are pretty much equivalent. Now you may at first think this is actually a good thing because you've got more room, you've got more comfortable positions for the crew, you've got more stowage, you also have a bigger target. Now the reason this was done is located to the left here. The engine in the tank is mounted pretty much the same way as it is on this stand, except you know, a slight forward angle to allow the power shaft to go under the turret basket. It's a tall engine, you need a tall engine bay. But the other advantage to the tall engine bay is that you can fit a whole variety of engines into this one tank, which is applicable considering the American manufacturing capability of the time. Moving to the hull, the cast hull marks this as an M4A1. Welded hull variants were simple M4s. Now there was a composite or hybrid version that had a cast front and a welded back. The US Army categorized those as plain M4s. The armor is about 2 inches thick, starts at about 37 degrees, goes up to about 55 at the top, giving it an effective thickness of between 2.5 to 3.5 inches. On a welded hull Sherman, that 2 inch plate is at an even 57. Uh, this, if you cut the slope, is a better part of three and a half inches and it compares quite favorably to, say, the T-34 and better than most of the German tanks. There are, however, two small catches. Those are the bulges for the driver and the bow gunner. These are weak points. Surprise, surprise. So what they ended up doing was welding. You'll often see a lot of times a piece of sheet metal welded in front of these bulges to give a little bit of extra protection. Now the other catch with this is this is what you would call a small hatch Sherman. The early versions, because they had that steep slope, didn't have much room on the roof of the hull to allow the hatch. So the hatches on the early versions were very small. The earliest M4s actually came with a direct vision port in the bulge itself, but that was soon deleted. Moving on to the components, we're going to start off with the most important part of the tank. No, it's not the gun, and it's not in this case. Now, if you think about it, it's a small quirk of geography. 
Unlike most of the other combatants, the US was separated from the rest of the world and the fighting by a couple of small bodies of water called the Atlantic and the Pacific. This meant that you had to get whatever it was you built in Ohio and in Detroit and Wisconsin and everywhere else that they were making tanks from the US to, say, Europe on a ship. To get it onto the ship, you had to lift it up. We didn't have back then the roll-on, roll-off ships that we're familiar with today. You actually had to get a crane, hook onto the lifting ice, lift it up, put it over and down into the hold. Now your next catch is that most of the cranes of the time had a weight limit and a lot of that weight limit was frequently 40 ton, which uh, basically put an upper end limit. You could build a heavy tank in the US, but if most of your ship cranes or most of your land cranes couldn't lift it in and out of the ship, it's not gonna do you a heck of a lot of good. So that was why the American heavy tank never really found great favor. Now, there were other problems with them as well. The M6 Heavy, for example, was mechanically unreliable, got awful huge and ugly and whatever. Uh, but by and large, the Americans pinned their flag to the medium tank and, of course, the lights. As we move on a little bit, we have the brush guards covering the service lights and marker lights, another brush guard for the siren, and we have a G stamp for General Steel. Now, General Steel were basically a subcontractor. If memory serves, it was about 4,237 parts in an M4A4, and about 80 of them were subcontractors. Now, this meant that General Steel, we were, of course, in the US, were shipping these castings to Montreal for final production. As we move further on, we go to the three piece transmission housing. Now, of course, later on, he ended up with single piece and then finally the shark nose. But all the grizzlies were made as new as we can tell with the three piece. This is one of the later versions of the three piece, though, because you have this little lip protecting the bolts. The idea of the bolts, well, simple enough. If you have to change out the transmission or something like that, you simply unbolt this, hook up a crane, pull off the housing. There's your transmission right in front of you. It took about two hours to change a transmission, which by the standards of the time, especially if you compare it to the Panther we did before, is pretty quick. The bolts were originally open and exposed and susceptible to enemy fire, which meant that when you had to quickly change the transmission, you had to spend half the time just shearing off the bolt. So this lip was added for protection. By the end of Sherman's production run, though, the uh, housing completely encased the bolt. The bolt was in a recess and thus much more protected. Now, while I'm here, I'm going to go off on a little bit of a tangent. Uh, I was having a chat once on the phone with Tom Yentz, who made me feel like I knew absolutely nothing. Uh, but he postulated to me that Sherman's reputation for reliability was overstated, and that in fact it was not any more reliable than any other tank of the time. Which of course raises an eyebrow, because we all know that Sherman was praised for its reliability. And to some extent it was, I mean, you compare it with the early Cromwells, for example, yeah, it definitely was. But compared to other in-service vehicles, I have never actually done a per-mile breakdown rate assessment. The way he put it was, and I think he might have been onto something, the reliability of Sherman came from the operational readiness rate. When a commander said, tomorrow morning we're going to attack with my 100 tanks, how many of them would actually cross the start line? And it would be 99 or 100 tanks. And the reason they could do that was because of the maintainability of the tank. There is a couple of features here. So firstly, you've already mentioned how quickly it is to exchange parts. The second thing is that the Americans brought spare parts and they brought a lot of them. Unlike say the Germans where units would be fighting each other at the train depot to get a part, Americans had spare parts coming out the wazoo. I mean, they basically have entire tanks in individual component form sitting in the warehouses. So we have to repair a tank. Let's say the transmission needs replacing, pull off the housing. Go get a spare part, bring the spare part back, plug it in, it will fit perfectly. Because American parts were built to high design tolerances. Uh, if you saw like a vice or other fitting uh, materials on the workbench, it was a sign of incompetence. Because if you did your job right the first time, the part fit. So you now have this part that fits, goes right in, you close up the transmission housing, you're done in two hours, you can go on to the next tank. So you could change three Sherman transmissions and say the same amount of time would it take you to do one Panther. Put that way, he, I think he very well may have a point. Now, again, I have not done the per mile reliability assessment rating checks. If anybody out there on the web has done so or can link to them, 
please put it in the comments. I'll be curious to see the results. Other features on the front, that little tangent over. The gun crutch, aka travel lock. Gun crutch, of course, is what the English will call it. And the bow 30 caliber machine gun. That's the front. That didn't take too long. Let's go around the side. So as you come around to the side of the tank, you see that the running gear is pretty much taken straight off of the M3 medium. But there are a couple of minor differences. The tracks are not one of them. They're the same 16 and 9 16 of an inch wide. They came in a smorgasbord of variations. I'm not going to go list them all right now, but I am going to mention the Canadian dry pin. CDP was a shorter pitched track. There were more links per side, meant that you had to have more teeth on the sprocket wheel. So if you're looking at a Sherman and you see that there seems to be a rather an inordinate amount of teeth on the sprocket, the chances are you're dealing with a Commonwealth vehicle. Uh, obviously the Canadians like CDP the most, but I do believe that the British use them as well. Now the problem with the narrow track also carries on from the M3 medium. The thinking behind it is if you have a small narrow track, just less weight of metal that you got to haul around, your tank will go faster which is fine on hard surface, not so fantastic if you're going around in the mud in Russia. So, some workarounds were developed. The first workaround was a simple duck bill. This is an extended end connector. There's basically a little plate that comes out a couple inches, gives you a little bit more surface area in contact with the ground. If this wasn't enough, you could then move to the Easy 9 suspension. And what this was, was there was a spacer that you will put in between the bogey and the hull side. It will shove the bogey out about six inches, and there's another advantage to the modularity of the bogey system. You then had enough room to mount additional extended end connectors on the inside of the track, and this really did increase the flotation capability of the vehicle. One of these E9s is still visible at the National World War II Museum down in New Orleans, if you happen to be down that way and want to look it up. The bogies were originally the light duty version, or at least what we would now know as light duty. The return roller was up top and center. In the middle of 1942, they changed. They moved the roller to the rear, and that's your visual identifier. They replaced it with a metal skid, and that design kind of tweaked a little bit over time. But most importantly was they increased the diameter of the springs under here from 7 inches to 8 inches, making them a lot more durable. The whole system would span a 7.5 foot trench. It would climb a 24 inch wall. And you, you look at the M10 that we did before, and that would only scale an 18-inch wall. Why the difference? Because the running gear is the same. As near as I can tell, it's a matter of weight. The M4 had a little bit more weight pushing down on the track and gave you a little bit more grip. The last thing I'll mention while we're on the subject of running gear is the gap in between the bogies. Now, on most M4s, the spacing between the wheels is pretty much the same as you have here. The exception is the M4A4. This had a longer engine, the entire hull needed to be extended, which meant that the bogies were spread out a bit further. So an M4A4 would have a gap between the bogies maybe the size of an additional road wheel. The primary user of the M4A4 was the British. There was also the M4A6, but you almost never see any of those. As you move up a little bit, uh, just forward there is a mount for either a radio antenna, or if there's no radio because it's not a command tank, a ventilator. And then we move to the sponson where much of the ammunition was stowed. This is actually in common with a lot of other tanks, uh, despite the reputation that M4 had for burning. It was indeed the ammunition that was the cause, not the petrol. And there were a couple of different solutions proposed. Eventually, of course, wet stowage, but the interim solution was applique armor. You simply put more armor between the guys shooting at you and the ammo. Whether or not it actually did sufficient amounts of use is another matter. But so they put the applique anyway, and then he put a nice big white helpful aiming mark so that the gunners could still get their detonations anyway. As you move further up, uh, you'll see a lot of Shermans will have similar applique armor on the front of the turret. The reason this was done was that in order to make room for the gun control equipment on the inside of the tank, they had to shave out some of the metal of the wall of the turret. This meant that you had thin armor now between the outside world and the gunner and the TC. The long-term solution was a new casting of the turret. You'll see some turrets that actually have a bulge 
cast into it. The short-term solution was just, from the factory, additional plates of applique armor that would be simply welded to the side.